Hi, I'm Giddy Monk, I'm here to talk to you about Starverses, or more specifically, Eclipsa, aka the Queen of Darkness, and the show's best mamma jamma. I want to do a video on her, her husband, and her daughter, and I'm starting with her first. Why? Well, recently, I reached 10k subs. Yay! I know, I celebrated when I got to 5k, but I should do something better. So thank you guys so much. It's a special treat, we're discussing Eclipsa. So what can I say about Eclipsa? Well, she's my favorite character. And next to Lilith and Tiffany Valentine, one of my fictional style icons. I'm sure you're probably wondering why it took me so long to make a video on her. I mean, I was pretty close to writing a script back in December. Instead of being a linear video, it was gonna be one of those question videos. I wanted to discuss whether or not Eclipsa was right to leave Muni, but why? Why did it never get made? Well, to everybody who posts counter arguments, I'm thankful for you guys. I mean, sometimes you guys can get kind of mean, or you call me a furry, but I do try to take your comments into consideration when I make videos. Except the furry one, because I am not a furry. My avatar is a cat, but I'm not a furry. I'm one of those people who can't take criticism, but on YouTube, it's the only way you get better. Part of being a YouTuber is changing and evolving, and I felt I was way too one-sided with Eclipsa. I don't think she was a bad queen until I read the comment section. And I found I was kind of biased, especially with season four. I don't like to make videos that are just me saying this person is amazing for 20 minutes. Therefore, I gave myself more time. I watched all the Eclipse episodes I could. I talked with people on Reddit, the whole nine yards. So what do I think now? Compared to Moon, I still think Eclipsa is a great character. Probably one of the few reasons to watch the whole show till the end. She's the show's most complex character. She's funny and she has a great backstory. However, I do think think your character arc could have been a little better, especially in season four. Not that I think she's like Mabel or Star, but there was still more they could have done with her or said about her. To see what I mean, let's start from the beginning. Now, there's a lot to cover, so I'm separating what happens into three separate parts. The first part goes from season two to the butterfly trap, which I'll call the evil era. The second is until the end of season three, which I'll call the post-evil era. The third and final will be the queen of darkness era, which will cover her until the end of the show. So let's start things off with the evil era. Eclipsa is one of the former queens of Muni, a relic that's approximately 300 years old. We don't learn about her until season 2, specifically the episode Into the Wand. When Star journeys to find the thing that doesn't belong, she comes upon the royal family's tapestry room, or as she calls it, Grandma Room. This scene is mostly used to set up future plot points, with the exception of one queen. Selena the Shy. Oh, great great grandma Shy. I don't know if that was a red herring, or if they did intend to give her a bigger role, but never did. Who knows? One tapestry she comes upon is Eclipse's, which I think is supposed to depict a biased account of her second wedding. Eclipsa, queen of Muni, to a Muman king was wed, but took a monster for her love and away from Muni fled. Since this is after Star begins to tolerate monsters, she doesn't find her to be all that bad. <laughs> Bad girl. Basically, Eclipsa is the boogeyman of Muman Queens. When she was a teenager, her mother, Solaria the Monster Carver, was killed in a surprise raid, so she inherited the wand. And I'll be honest, I fought for the longest time that Solaria was her mom before they actually confirmed it. Star Versus has a pattern of the previous queen being the total opposite of her successor. And what better irony for Eclipsa, a total monster smoocher. Anyway, Solaria wrote in her will that Eclipsa had to marry Prince Shastakan of the Spider Bites. She abandoned into people so she could run off with a monster. She didn't respect the natural order. She meddled in the dark arts and created her own chapter of dangerous evil magic. And for what Baby says, she seems to be the most powerful queen in recent memory. The only person who comes close is Star. I haven't seen anything like this since Queen Eclipsa. Only Glossaric can speak about her with any fondness. Every queen wants to tell me how to do my job. Only butterfly to leave me be was your great-grandmother, Eclipsa, the Queen of Darkness. They intentionally leave what happened to Eclipsa super vague, but most of us assume she was long dead. Since we're on that subject, I will say that yes. Whether or not Eclipsa is evil doesn't matter. She was still selfish. She betrayed her kingdom. She had a job to do, and that job was to marry Shastakan and make little princesses. And even if she left the spellbook and the wand behind, that doesn't change the fact that his queen 
Queen, she abandoned her people. But that was also a semi-complicated situation, and there's other things she could have done. The Book of Spells implies that the Kings of Muni are to us what most queens were historically, trophies and baby makers. And along with some comments in Game of Flags, if a queen wants to divorce a king, she can. Eclipse would probably alienate the spider bites, but hey. Besides, Eclipse's father never ruled as king. Solaria didn't have any interest in taking one, so she asked one of her advisors to conceive a child with her when the time felt right. I don't know, it's complicated and because of how things were written, who knows if Solaria really wanted Eclipse to marry Shastakan. But while I think Eclipse leaving was still a bad move, there were other ways around it. Regardless of her current status, Eclipse lives on through her chapter, the Forbidden Chapter. Forbidden? Is that what they're calling my chapter? Yeah, sorry, I didn't name it. But because of her affiliation with dark magic and the possibility it can taint people... Are you truly sure it could taint you? Yeah, they never say the criteria. I mean, Marco and Ludo get corrupted, but not Star. Anyway, the chapter is locked away, and most queens don't even think to look at it. Mostly. Ever the rebel princess, Star often reads Eclipse's chapter, even when she wasn't supposed to. Have you ever even read it? <laughs> of course not. Well, I have, and it really wasn't that big of a deal. Ludo also tries to read it, but this causes Toffee to take over. One question I'm sure you might have is Stark claims she read Eclipse's chapter, so why doesn't she know the big twist? Well, knowing Star, she probably didn't read all of it. She just wanted to look at Eclipse's spells, and so that was it. During Battle for Muni, Star learns Eclipse is very much alive, albeit in a crystal. Eclipse is alive, and I made a deal with her. Let's back up a bit. 30 years ago, Toffee killed Comet, yada yada yada, and Moon was torn between signing a peace treaty or going to war. Since the class rate is no help, she gets the idea to use dark magic, as it's the only way to kill a Satarian. Just one thing, how did Moon know Eclipsa was alive? Consulting Romulus, Moon confronts Eclipsa in one of my favorite scenes. She holds her wand out, readying herself for whatever the Queen of Darkness has in store. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I killed her! And then we get her evil declaration. Me for... Me for... You want the candy? Before, 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 before. Is it weird I'd do the same if I were Eclipsa? I mean, I'd probably ask for a soda since I hate chocolate, but I understand the frustration. Plus, it'd be super petty to get the Queen of Muni to spend money on you, even if it's like a dollar. The whole purpose of the scene is to make it ambiguous if Eclipsa really is as evil as they say, and it's full of what one might consider red flags. For one, she consoles Moon over her mom dying. I lost my mother too, and I was not much older than you. But is it because she's emphasizing with a grieving girl? Or is it just to get Moon to let her guard down? Was this what led her down the path of darkness? Then there's also moments like this. How long have I been here? 300 years? <coughs> 300 years. Watching this scene, you could make the argument that she's like Bill Cipher, or she's super eccentric and hilarious, but that doesn't excuse the fact she's bad news and has a scheme or two up her sleeve. I want to buy my own chocolate, or those little shrink wrap muffins at the bottom. Of course, she doesn't look it. She's a poised, elegant lady, but Bill looks like a junk food mascot. I watched a really good analysis on the scene by Slice of Otaku, which you should 100% check out. But to summarize, since I have a lot I want to get to, this scene can go one of two ways. Either Eclipse is so insane she just doesn't care that 300 years have passed, or her life back then was so bad she just doesn't care. There's also what's going on with her arms. <laughs> So Moon asks for a spell to kill an immortal, and Eclipsa lays down the law. The spell you seek requires a magical contract. Once your enemy is killed, you must give me something in return. What do you want? My freedom. Not knowing what else to do, Moon agrees to the deal. And as soon as she gets the spell, Romulus raises her. The next day, Moon goes to confront Toffee. And as she recites the spell, Will you crush my heart to burning coal? to summon forth the deathly power, to see my hated foe devoured. Ah! Being the worst if she lets Eclipse go, she compromises by aiming for Toffee's finger. The Zack scatters his army, keeps Eclipse imprisoned, and once again, war is in full swing. This episode alone provides us with many burning questions, all of which get answered later on. Slightly wondering what I thought when I first saw the scene. Well, I didn't know what to think. There was enough evidence to go either or. On the one hand, I could see Eclipse being a victim of circumstance, a kooky woman who got remembered for her worst decision, but being alright in all other aspects. Practicing dark magic doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad person. In fiction, lots of characters use dark magic, but this isn't portrayed as them being evil, just unorthodox. Moon even said it herself. She didn't seem so evil. 
But if you know a thing or two about history, many evil people don't seem evil. It doesn't excuse the fact they run untold tragedies or have awful beliefs, but hey, it's super fun to learn about. I thought Eclipso would be a mixed bag, where she probably did commit atrocities and it rubs off on Star. She's ultimately much more complicated than we expect. Since Star destroyed Toffee, Eclipso gets released and semi disguises herself to go to Butterfly Castle. And by disguise, I mean she literally just doesn't wear her neck thing and she takes off her hat. Which is flowers. It's not like there's something really cool. Like a squirrel or corn. They never say what she was doing there, though. It's like if you murdered somebody and you returned to the crime scene. When the cops are still there. Are you asking to get caught? Would you gonna steal the wand? See how things were before going to find Globgor? Actually, that's another another thing. One issue they never touch on with Eclipsa is the fact she comes from a different time. Yeah, she was super liberal back then, but things were different 300 years ago. They never do any fish out of water plots, and Eclipsa readjusts pretty quickly. I don't know if that's bad or good, and it doesn't matter, since she meets Star and the two seem to hit it off. I might have some self-control issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. She even manages to calm down Glossaric. Isn't that right? Globgar! Globgar! I Globgar! Oh, they were clever. Still drinking the flavor aid, Moon agrees with the MHC that Eclipsa is evil and tries to once again force her bigotry onto Star. But she can get into your head and make you do things you don't want to do. Giving you that spell to destroy Toffee was her idea. Oh no, wait. You were the one who went to her for help. One time Star was right about anything until the Mina fiasco. Yeah, Eclipse did a selfish deed, I said it above, and the show doesn't try to hide it. Mm hmm, yes, right, I knew that, kinda selfish. That's the only thing she did that they know of, and for this, they're treating her pretty unfairly. And they're obviously not telling Star or Moon the full story. I mean, what's next? You gonna crystallize me if I do something you don't approve of? Wanting to shut up Star, they agree to give Eclipse a fair trial. Hey, where are you going? Well, it's going to take a little time to get the trial all set up. For the next dozen or so episodes, Eclipse remains under house arrest, acting as something of an ant to Star, with Star going to her with questions she normally wouldn't ask Moon. There's the episode where Marco comes back to Muni, and it's Eclipse who gets her to actually think about what she wants. Well, now that he's here, do you want him to stay? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> then there's the episode where Star sleep spells, and Eclipse provides the philosophy that all knowledge is good knowledge. Which isn't always true, but to each their own. Like I said before, they're super ambiguous about everything. They said you could be in my mind and I wouldn't even know. Oh, definitely not. But if I were, I wouldn't tell you. That's a joke. What's interesting is despite all the talk about Eclipse of being evil, she never tries to use magic to escape, break out, or just because she's bored. You can make the argument she's biding her time, but if you're such a powerful queen, why waste all that energy manipulating a teenager? She never busts down the doors, and in Stranger Danger, she never tried to fight back. Kinda creepy how in certain scenes she doesn't do much besides staring out into the distance like a porcelain doll. Yeah, they answered in another episode why she never did anything. I never learned magic without a wand. Yeah, we know that at the time, but there's another interesting tidbit. Oh, Captain! Permission to come aboard? If she doesn't want to use magic, she could have easily used stealth. Did she just stay to humor Star because she grew an attachment to her? Or because if she left, where exactly would she go? She doesn't have dimensional scissors, so she can't just run away. And wherever she went, the MHC would surely find her. Then we get a major reveal about Miss Hanus. She's her mama! It means she's a butterfly. At the time, this could have meant a lot of things. Maybe Meteora was a secret child Eclipse hid away, so Hanus grew up to run St. Olga's to sort of spite her mom. Maybe the real reason Eclipse left was to have a shotgun wedding. Maybe Eclipse had a human daughter who found out about Meteora and imprisoned her mother and half-sister. Until season 4, one of my favorite dynamics was Moon and Eclipse. They're a great take on the odd couple. Two very different women who bond over the fact they care about their families. And there's a problem, you just mind your eyes up! <laughs> <gasps> what have I done? Oh, come on. You did that on purpose. When Moon learns the truth about Hanus, she confronts Eclipsa. As historically, Eclipsa's daughter is Vestivia. That's when the truth comes out. Vestivia? No. What? My daughter was Meteora. Eclipsa says they can always go to the archives in search of the truth. And I just want to say that, yeah, Moon has really been kept in the dark, and she has not questioned a single thing. The archive? In the bureaucracy of magic, where they keep lunch receipts and office supplies? Oh, don't judge a room by its supplies. 
Throughout the journey, Moon comes to see more of Eclipse's perspective. Like Sir, she learns that while Eclipse might seem insane in the membrane, she does know her way, being very resourceful throughout her journey. And despite what it seems, she does keep her word, going to get Moon when she can't fit through a rat hole. When they get to the archives, we find out that somebody wanted the truth hidden really badly, so much so to the point where they even rewrote history. Princess Festivia was crowned queen upon her mother's imprisonment. They took her out. They erased all record of my daughter completely. In the end, Moon begins to sympathize with Eclipsa, but before she can name a culprit, the episode ends. That takes us to probably my favorite episode next to Schooled, The Butterfly Trap. Except for that whole joke with Sean. Could you talk a, a bit slower, please? No. Seriously, I hate that annoying moose thing. Can somebody punch him in the face for me? Since everybody who knew Eclipsa, except for the Magic High Commission, of course, is likely long dead, and Eclipsa's crime happened 300 years ago, they can't name any witnesses or use any evidence. Instead, they have to sort through a bunch of unverified reports. These are all secondhand accounts, oral histories, folk stories, none of them verified. And then you question Eclipsa about each and every one, meaning the trial is sure to go on for hours, if not days. Thankfully, Eclipsa knows a way to speed things up. They'll do a trial by box. Who do you have a crush? Queen Moon! Uh -oh. Ew, you perv. You knew her when she was born. And you're like millions of years older than her. Talk about jailbaiting. The rules are simple. Each member of the Magical High Commission shall ask one question, and the accused must answer. Despite the fact the box is fair in judging Eclipsa, it's pretty clear that the whole trial is a farce. At least with the first idea, there was a small chance Eclipsa could be found innocent. With the box, either Eclipsa will just dig herself deeper. I have not eaten even a single baby. Now, I did hurt the occasional teenager, but only psychologically and they always deserved it. Or the Magic High Commission will take whatever she says at face value, not question exactly why she did them. Like, yeah, arguments say you could murder somebody, but the point of a trial isn't just to prove whether or not you did it, but why you did it. If she's about to be sentenced, Eclipse outsmarts the MHC. One moment. I haven't asked my question. Wait. What? Since Eclipsa was a queen of Muni, and she's obviously still alive, that means she was a member of the MHC. So Moon decides Eclipsa gets to ask one question. What did you do with my daughter? The Magic Eye Commission denies all charges. I have no idea what she's talking about. We didn't do anything with your daughter. And honestly, I I'm kind of offended. Everyone no! Despite it being incredibly obvious, they are so stubborn, they're willing to get crushed to death. And not just them and Eclipsa, but Moon and Star, two people they claim to care about. We didn't do anything wrong! Hook seems to differ! So that's when Star goes off on them. You enforce the laws of magic on everyone around you, and yet for some reason, you can lie to us? How does that make you any different than the villain you say Eclipsa is? Again, this whole situation is the only time Star is right, at least for a while. So they lay out the truth. Mr. Khan, he wanted nothing to do with your half monster daughter. So we swapped her out, we gave her the royal magic wand, and she became the next queen of Munich. Jessica Kane found her a caregiver in the form of St. Olga's and threw her to the wayside, like Disney did to the Owl House. To make up for the lack of a princess, the Magic High Commission found a peasant baby, named her Festivia, and raised her. And as we learned from the Book of Spells, this pretty much ensured that every queen until Comet did absolutely nothing, or at worst, they kept the status quo. So basically, it's a mistrial. Yeah, Eclipse is found guilty, but because the MHC are exposed, Eclipse is technically pardoned. This concludes the trial! Although, if we're all being honest here, it seems like y'all still have some issues to deal with. However, this means one thing. Not only are the current butterflies not technically royalty, even if they married royalty and Star's father was a prince, so diluted or not, they still have royal blood, but Star discovers the woman she spent weeks bonding with is in her... Great, 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 great something, Grandma. No, sweetie, I'm not. I love this line. It showed Eclipsa cared so much for her. So Star releases Eclipsa, and that completes the evil arc. Now, this arc was fantastic. No criticism here. I guess if I did have to nitpick, there's the question of Vestivia. The spellbook mentions Vestivia was raised by the Magic Hat Commission. They told her Eclipsa and Shastakin were her parents, but they were eaten by monsters. Because of this, Vestivia never questioned things or sought out the truth. She stayed held up in her castle, throwing parties, while the Solarians did all the fighting for her. Again, not even realizing the only 
only reason the monsters invaded was a legitimate one. I do want to know what the royal court thought, what they knew, or if Eclipse even had other relatives. We do know Justin married a spider bite duchess, but did he ever have children? If you're wondering about Vestivia not having cheek marks, Sora mentions in a guidebook that they come from exposure to magic. They could have just said Vestivia was a late bloomer. I guess another nitpick is I wish Eclipse interacted more with River. I don't think they ever actually talk until season 4. Yeah, we didn't need it, but hey, it would have been cool. River, go take a bath. Yes, dear, but only because you asked me. So let's get to the post-evil era, which is only a few episodes, but pretty important in the grand scheme of things. After the trial, Eclipse is allowed to remain at the Butterfly Castle as a pseudo-relative. Because Hainus, now Meteora, has found out who her parents are, she decides to launch a coup. Only, Meteora doesn't have a real army, any true influence, or any idea of diplomacy. So her plan is to basically destroy everything in her path, and then become queen of the ashes. If she's embraced her heritage, she learned she has an ability to suck souls. Yep, I think the Dutch worked. Ew. She ends up sucking so many, ew. The moon is called to investigate, and Eclipse attacks along, hoping to resolve things peacefully. Once they find Meteora, Eclipse's efforts do help, and their reunion goes pretty smoothly. Terrible, terrible people locked me up in a dingy old crystal, deep down in a dark dungeon. Then Eclipse has to make up for lost time by acting like the cool mom. What would you like instead? You can have anything you want. The throne of Muni. I'm afraid that's not possible. Meteora does the whole, well, you said, and instead of blasting her mom, she walks off. <sighs> Young lady, you turn right back around! Thinking she knows what's best, Moody attacks Meteora, but just as she's about to lose, Eclipse is able to talk her down. I love you! I know you haven't heard these words in a very long time, but I'm saying them again to you now. Please, Meteora, come back to me. Then Moon has to go and ruin it like she ruins everything. I... Oh! I am ending this. Obviously, Eclipsa tries to defend her daughter, and in the process, accidentally dips down. <laughs> It's very important I say accidental. Moon! Moon's body, basically on autopilot, ends up running away to the realm of magic, while Meteor runs off, more powerful than ever. Now one topic I do want to touch on is whether or not this scene is Eclipse's fault. In season 4, Moon uses this as justification for her resentment. You're the reason I was lost in the magic dimension. You're the reason I was separated from my family. From my daughter! Maybe she did have a hand in it, but I argue it's really not. One, it's an accident. And two, Moon was attacking Eclipse's daughter, while Eclipse was in the process of talking her down. I mean, it'd be one thing if the talking didn't work, but still. Maybe in the heat of the moment, Moon might have thought Eclipse did it on purpose, but Eclipse more than makes up for it later. The next episode, Star, acting as queen, interrogates Eclipse, and afterwards, she puts Eclipse back on house arrest. Star? What are you going to do? What are you going to do to my daughter? Come on, Marco. You might think that Star is in the wrong, but I don't think so. From her perspective, at least. Star wasn't there, and she doesn't know the full story. All she knows is her mom's gone, and Eclipsa had something to do with it. Because of this, Star now has to put on her big girl pants and handle all the important stuff she isn't qualified for. And come on, let's be real. Meteor is likely going to be looking for Eclipsa, so better to be sure they know where she is. Weirdly, I thought the last few episodes were going to have Eclipsa become evil. Like, she's given a second chance, but because she's never been allowed to be with her daughter, she goes to the dark side and helps with the rebellion, and ultimately, Meteora would win and become queen. Thankfully, they proved me wrong. In Conquer, Meteora is the toughest antagonist Star has ever faced, since she's super durable and she isn't letting up. Star even dips down and throws all the magic she can at her, but Meteora is still kicking! You little brat. Are you? Where are you? And just as she's about to lose... Huh? Eclipsa does what she should have done a long time ago, and puts Meteora in time out. Forever time out. Black Velvet Inferno. Oh, mommy? <laughs> Clearly, it wasn't an easy decision to make. I'm sorry. 
What did you do? What I had to. Something I appreciate about this moment, and what the show forgets after this point. As queen, it is your duty to do what is best for your people. Even if they end up hating you for it. Yeah, I disagree with Moon, but she put it one way. To be great, you have to make sacrifices. Star might be a rebel princess, but even she learns helping monsters isn't that easy. I mean, look what she did for Buffrock, and he still left. Eclipse had never cared, and she tried to get out of it by doing things her way. Putting Meteora down was hard, but let's be real here. What exactly was her plan afterwards? Destroy everything else? Take her anger out on the rest of the multiverse? Seeing just what Eclipse gave up? Star does what her mother never had the guts to do. Keep it. This wand was yours. Things haven't been right since my family took the kingdom. The best thing I can do as queen is return what my family stole from you. Things get better for Eclipsa. The kingdom's returning to normal, and as for Meteora... <laughs> for Glosseric, now that Eclipsa has her wand and her daughter, there's only one thing left to do. Go find the love of her life, who is hiding right under our noses. Hello, my love. We're home. And that completes the post-evil arc. Once again, no problem with this. I guess because it's so short, this is gonna be probably the only section I don't really comment on. So let's get to the final era, the Queen of Darkness era. This is where the issues start to creep in. In the beginning, Eclipsa has it all. She's queen, and she's willing to give the job a second try. She also tries to freak Lobcourt, but to no avail. Except there is trouble, just not enough and the wrong kind. For one, the Mumins hate Eclipsa. Not because her daughter wrecked Muni and almost killed them all, but just because. A major subplot is Star heading a PR campaign. Nobody ever thinks to tell the humans that history was altered. Maybe it wouldn't get rid of the monster prejudice, but it would likely persuade some people. Your idea of a famous person, be it a politician or a celebrity, often changes once you learn what really went on, since it changes your perception of what happened. If you like, say, Spongebob and Tom Kenny got convicted of violently stalking someone, you're likely not going to watch certain episodes with Spongebob and Squidward the same way again. Star Versus is all about fixing history. They could have discussed how our perception of history changes, and why we're willing to look at things in a new light. They could have done Independence Day, but on a national scale. And then there's another thing. Eclipse is a monster sympathizer, and unlike Star, she knows that tolerance isn't easy. I mean, that's why she ran away from home. Except, despite having monster servants, and giving the monsters their land back, Eclipse does very little to actually help them. I did like the fact that they showed giving the monsters their land back had consequences, but they could have gone further. Like, maybe she tries to make rule to integrate monsters and faces a lot of pushback. Also, one issue I want to bring up is the butterfly castle, since many people say it's one thing Eclipsa could have done to help curry favor. Instead of repairing it, she takes up shelter in the monster temple, which maybe it could have worked as a temporary residence, but Eclipsa still should have tried to fix it. It maybe incorporated monster influences. Ironically, I think started more for monsters than Eclipsa. Eclipsa is kind of like McDonald's. She's alright, but eh, nothing too special. What do you think you're doing up here? Well, I was just- I'm sorry, did you just say I'm avoiding an important meeting with the spider bite? Oh no, that was today! She meets with Moon, and even if it isn't her fault, apologizes for what happened. Moon, I'm so sorry for everything that happened. I- Eclipsa, it's okay. And while Moon says she doesn't trust her, the two are at least cordial. Behind the scenes, Star is starting to lose trust in her. In one episode, Eclipse switches bodies with Romulus so she can freak Lobcore, but it's Star that talks her out of it. Ugh! How is anyone supposed to trust you if you use spells like that? How am I supposed to trust you? Then there's the issue of the spellbook. Eclipse confesses that she's upset she isn't as powerful as she should be, so she's on a quest to find the book of spells. If she had even a tiny piece, Glossary Silkworms could repair it. She questions Star, but thinking Eclipse will use it to release Glabgore, Star fibs. Now, I do take issue with this. Not because Star lied, but rather what they were suggesting. My first Star Wars video was an analysis all about the monster and the queen. I won't go too in-depth, but to summarize, in that episode, they hated how they had Star called Eclipsa, since all of Star's points were super hypocritical. Yeah, maybe Star had a right to be mad Eclipsa went through her mind, but still. This was the straw that broke the camel's back. But what's worse is we don't even see it. It takes place off screen. I may have gone inside your mind. That is so creepy, Eclipsa. 
a total game changer, and they never show it. Why not have the episode be a two-parter? Perhaps Eclipsa gets suspicious of Star, or she misses Glopgore. So out of desperation, she goes into Star's mind and learns the truth. That way, it seems like more of a betrayal. Star could try to stop her, but Glopgore beats her to it, and Eclipsa lets him go. Then we have the scene of Star telling her off. Looks like the book is back. And what do you know? It's turned to that crystal pulverizing spell. Stop. I can explain. So when's he coming out? You can't have an entire tragic episode about Eclipsa and Globcore and then have Star come and ran at her. Considering what we saw her give up, it feels less like Eclipsa was in the wrong, which yeah, she is, but it's more like Star is just being a killjoy for not letting a happy couple be together. During their mini argument, Eclipsa laments how her people haven't accepted her, not enough to even want to give her a proper coronation. So Star calls her bluff. That's right. Then they'll have to accept you and you will have to lead them. Maybe then you'll think twice before you get up to all this witchy stuff again. The ceremony's underway, and during the proceedings, Star learns Glavgor has been released. When she goes to tell Eclipsa, Eclipsa tries to do the right thing and postpone the event. Magical High Commission is officially declaring a state of emergency. All residents of Uni must remain in their seats until further notice. Star goes to retrieve Glavgor, but learns he's a good person. Or at least he seems more humble than his wife. Anyone? What? No! Of course not! Glavgor, Eclipsa and Meteora are already in danger. You gotta come with me. So Glavgor reluctantly returns to set the record straight. And like a soup kitchen volunteer, Romulus just has to stir the pot. I didn't do it! I swear! <laughs> oh. <gasps> Enough. Back to the crystal for you! An all-out battle ensues, and in the process, Meteora gets free and climbs through the flames. Putting aside whatever they might feel, the Mewmans show concern for her, because par monster or not, Meteora is still a baby. There's a baby in the fire! Baby? Glavgor wishes to go back in the slammer, believing it's the only way for his family to be safe. Over my dead body! That man was willing to stay in the crystal to keep his family safe. He's a dad. Letting her people decide, they accept Eclipsa, and the Corno Nation is a success. And as it turns out, the person who released Glavgor was Romulus. <laughs> All right, I did it! I let him out so you could see what a monster he really is! He gets arrested, and things end on a high note. Now I say it all the time, but this would have made for the perfect finale. Yeah, maybe there's more they could have done, like having Mina appear, or Ludo and Dennis. But if you see things from my perspective, this would have been a much better finale than Cleaved. Globgore and Eclipsa are reunited, the MHC are outed as the meddling bigots they are, but from the way it seems, Hekapu and Omni are still willing to put up with Eclipsa, and Star is going off to be a teen again everything would have been dealt with. Afterwards, Eclipsa doesn't really appear for a while, and Star has moved back in with Marco. Now Eclipsa is really going to be tested. Star won't clean up her messes anymore. Will she succeed? In the episode, Ready, Aim, Fire, Star finds the Munis under attack by none other than the Solarians. You're probably wondering what happened in the time frame since Star was gone, and for what I can tell, nothing. Which is super weird. Regardless of what Eclipsa did, the Solarians won't let up, and in the process, they mortally wound Glavgor. When even Star's spells don't work, Eclipsa is forced to use her last resort. I call the spell which has no name. Stand before the queen and cower! Keep this in mind. I swore I'd never use any of my mother's spells for fear of turning into her. And yet... Here I am! <laughs> you almost used one of her spells to release Globcorp, Missy May. Kind of picking and choosing, aren't we? Unfortunately, they learn Mina is the one calling the attack, and has dozens of Solarians at her beck and call. So they wall up in the monster temple. Mina tells Eclipse that they have until the rooster crows. So is that rooster gonna crow at sunrise or something? What? No, it's a dumb bird, Marco. It crows whenever it wants. And Star will not let her use the spell with no name. Yeah, that's right, you're not doing that spell again. That thing was insane! A little bit later, Moon shows up, promising to help, only to reveal... Mina's working for me. Okay, I already made a whole video on it, but outside of revealing Moon is the definition of denial, this still comes out of nowhere. Especially considering Corno Nation. Moon was in the audience. She saw the crowd accept Eclipsa. The fact Globgore was a decent person, etc, etc. Why attack them at this point? Yeah, sure, Eclipsa isn't the best queen, but from what I can tell, she did nothing awful when Star was gone. So it feels a little weird that Moon suddenly decides to do this revolution out of nowhere. Honestly, this should have been the mid-season finale. Perhaps Moon sees the influx of refugees 
refugees, and she goes to Muni and thinks Eclipsa isn't doing a very good job. Since Moon is one of those people who has a need to work, she could start the uprising then. And what better time? This is after Meteora destroyed everything, and the people still hate Eclipsa. It would seem like more of a struggle. Obviously, you would have to have Eclipsa become queen again. And then you could have Corno Nation. Moon says that if Eclipsa gives up, she'll call off the soldiers. I'll heal Glorgor at the Magic Sanctuary and you and your family will be free to live in any dimension of your choosing. Except this one. Kinda harsh considering what she did for your daughter. But Eclipsa gives in. I tried my best, but it appears my best wasn't enough. Which, again, is weird. Like, yeah, I know Eclipsa probably doesn't want to be a queen, but she hasn't exhausted every option. She still has a spell with no name, and as Solari's daughter, I'm surprised she doesn't know more about the warriors. Moon's speech didn't seem all that impactful. How is abandoning her throne the best thing for her people? I feel like, considering how much emphasis they put on Eclipsa being selfish, that should have been her downfall. Maybe in the times when Star was gone, Eclipsa could make a series of bad decisions, and that's what gets the humans to reject her. But Eclipsa hands over the wand, and by extension, the throne to moon. She goes to tell Mina, and shocked emoji, Mina isn't just gonna let her go peacefully. Oh, uh, to be perfectly honest, at this point, I'll, I'll skip the speech and be on my way. No one's going anywhere! Just as they're about to be pummeled, Hecapu saves them at the last possible minute and brings them to the tavern at the end of the multiverse. The implication being they should get a drink and let whatever happens, happens. But unlike Star and Moon, she isn't willing to give up as Glopgor is still in Muni and at Princess Psycho's mercy. Give me the scissors. Wait, what are you doing? Glopgor needs my help. She's also the only one who realizes they have other options. One, we stay here. Two, you give me my wand and I go back to Muni and blast those warriors and the three of us go back together to unleash a wicked bunch of nasty business on those warriors. <laughs> also, I just want to talk about this one scene. She deduces Moon was behind everything from the get-go. Thank you for freeing my husband. It was you who asked Romulus to release Globko at my coronation. He acts like a much better person by forgiving her. Meanwhile, Star has been weaseled by Glossrick into doing his dirty work for him. And now she wants to destroy all magic. Unfortunately, Eclipsa somehow agrees she's right. And in the process... The age of queens and magic needs to end. But you don't need to end it by yourself. When they're casting the spell, the spirits of the previous queens and Muni help out. This includes Comet in Solaria. In the end, they're successful. And we get one last scene between Eclipsa and her mother. Oh, for what it's worth. <laughs> I think you made the right choice. Well, I do think it's a little fan surfacy, and it gives me more questions than answers, it's still pretty sad. So magic is destroyed, and Eclipse and Meteora end up at Muni, lacking cheek marks. But since magic is no more, Globgor is saved. At long last, they're free, and she gets to have a family. I think that's what we'll do then. <laughs> I think we need more young ladies like her. Even if she's complicit in genocide. And she's still gonna have plenty of enemies after this happens. Like yeah, people forget Eclipse has still helped. Star wasn't gonna succeed if it weren't for her and Moon. At least you can argue she has more of a reason to want to destroy magic than either Star or Moon. She saw Solaria use magic to force a lot of racist policies. Magic was used to tear her family apart. That would have been cool to mention. And that was the end of the Queen of Darkness era. And my review on Eclipsa. Rewatching a few episodes and looking at things in a new light, yeah, Eclipsa is still my favorite character. She's funny, complex, and I have been trying to copy some of her style choices. But that doesn't mean she's flawless. There's still some topics they could have better addressed, but what we got was still pretty good. If you have problems with Star Versus, Eclipsa is certainly one of the reasons you should keep watching. I plan on doing a separate video for Glopcore and another for Meteora, so it was better I did the hard stuff first. And once again, thank you for 10,000 subscribers. I'm Kitty Monk, and thank you for watching. I will see you all, hopefully, next week.